What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. In today's video, we're gonna be doing something that I love to do every single year. It's actually one of my least viewed videos, but it's one of the most fun ones to produce, and that is our year in review. In this video, basically, I'm just gonna go over what were my favorite beers of the year, my least favorite, how uh, my equipment changed over time, what were the significant events, but we're also going to taste some significantly aged beer now. Um, I'm actually excited for the star of the show today, and this is the Christmas Weizenbach that I made last year. This has bottle conditioned and been cellared for over a year now. You can actually see a ton of dust on the bottle. Um, so I'm actually really excited to see how these beers have really matured in the bottle. Um, so we'll be tasting my triple from this year, my quad uh, once again, and the Christmas Weizenbach. There is, however, absolutely no getting around the fact that this was an absolutely amazing year for the channel, and I'm really, really thankful to each and every single one of you guys for watching, subscribing, supporting if you're new, and interacting with my videos, and I really hope that you guys have gotten a lot out of them. So over the course of this year, the channel grew significantly. On January 1st, 2022, I went from 14,633 subscribers to, as of today, 22,960 subscribers. So that's huge growth for the channel. I crossed over that 20,000 subscriber milestone, which is amazing news. That's a figure I didn't really think I would ever end up getting to, but um, keep up with this YouTube stuff long enough, and I guess enough people will turn out and like your content. Over the course of 2021, I brewed 21 beers and produced 45 videos, which is actually a little bit less than last year, um, although that's due to some pretty significant life events, which we'll talk about in a minute here. Of those 21 beers, I've taken a little bit of time to think about them and pick out my top three. So in the third place spot is the Maple Coffee Chocolate Stout that I brewed at the very beginning of this year. That was an absolutely delicious, uh, pastry style stout that had an absolutely amazing amount of flavor in it. Um, I use dry coffee beans in uh, kind of almost like a dry hopping step. I call it dry beaning, if you will, uh, where I steep the coffee beans in the fermenter. And that actually provided a ton of flavor and it was a really nice smooth, rounded coffee flavor, not bitter, not astringent uh, or anything like that. So it actually worked out really, really well. That beer was an absolutely perfect winter beer. Uh, nice and hearty, about 8%, I think it was. Uh, turned out just absolutely amazing. So I was very happy with that one. In the second place spot is actually this beer right here, the Belgian Triple, which we'll be tasting momentarily. So I'll save my tasting notes on this one for a few minutes from now. And then in the number one spot is the true champion of the Belgian beers, this Belgian Dark Strong Ale, Belgian Quad, uh, that I brewed just after getting back from my trip to Belgium. And again, we'll taste this one during the course of this video, so I'll save the tasting notes for later. But let's start out by jumping in to the Belgian Triple. Now, I'm not going to drink every single one of these beers in its entirety during this video because that would result in me getting very sloppy. So I'm going to slowly work on them throughout the course of the rest of the day. But I do want to deliver some good tasting notes here. So here's the triple. So the triple is pouring a really nice clear yellow gold kind of orange color, a really frothy white head with some very, very tight bubbles in it. Uh, really nice quick looking beer. You can see the massive amount of carbonation in that. I bottle conditioned these to about three and a half volumes of CO2 if I remember correctly. Um, and they turned out pretty nice. Wow, yeah, the aroma on this one certainly smells like a Belgian triple. Ooh, you get that nice spiciness. Coriander, orange, and a um, little bit of bubble gum as well. So let's go in for flavor. And for you Belgian beer snobs out there, um, these have been sitting out on the table warming up as I was setting up the shots. They're at about like the 45 to 55 degree range, so we should be getting the proper expression of Belgian character in these beers. Woo! Wow. That's aged really nice. Wow. <laughs> Dang. Uh, orange blossom honey. A lot of honey sweetness, kind of faux sweetness. Um, cracked white pepper, orange peel, lavender. Very complex flavor that evolves as you drink it. Almost a, uh, a candied kind of character to it as well. Um, 
The grains are starting to come through a little bit more. That kind of high, that nice Belgian Pilsner malt character is coming through in a less bready way, in a more um, complex and semi-sweet way. This is a really, really nice triple. Um, and it just got even nicer as it aged. This is a real treat. Um, so yeah, happy with that one for sure. Lots of the bubble gum and a little bit of clove coming out too. It's just super nice. It's beers like this where when you're having a near religious experience drinking them and can't believe that you made it yourself, um, <laughs> that makes it all really worth it. But while I'm consuming this outstanding beer, let's also talk about my three uh, least successful beers or my three least favorite beers of the year. So we'll start with the third from the bottom, which was the Huel Melon from Garden Kvike Pale Ale that I made uh, about halfway through the year. While the beer itself was definitely a success, the actual uh, flavor of it wasn't the best. Um, it, the Huel Melon hops that I used didn't really come through in any sort of great quantity, so I didn't really get to taste them very well. And then the From Garden yeast, uh, which is a much more farmhousey kind of kvike, really did come through, and it was a very um, like mushroomy, dusty, earthy flavor that I did not find myself enjoying, um, and it just didn't work very well in that beer. I didn't dump it; I drank through the whole thing, but it was not necessarily a delicious beer, uh, and that's why it earns the third place from the bottom spot. In the second from the bottom spot is my Belgian Brown Ale. Um, if you guys watched this video, it came out maybe five or six weeks ago. It was not a great success because I pitched my yeast far too hot. Um, I was using 3522 Ardennes Ale yeast and uh, I had been brewing a whole bunch of Kvikes earlier, so I'm used to pitching those hot and I had a few beers during the brew day, wasn't paying attention, and I pitched my Ardennes Ale yeast at like a little north of 85 degrees into the fermenter and holy crap did that beer have a ton of fusel alcohols and acetaldehyde and just nasty off flavors. It was not good. I did end up dumping that batch. Uh, it did not really come out very well. <laughs> it was an interesting concept and I definitely want to rebrew it, but um, not my favorite beer of the year by any means whatsoever. And then the final spot for the worst beer of the entire year, my least favorite overall, the English Pale Ale that I failed on uh, to actually brew correctly. There was a myriad of things that went wrong during that brew day. So for starters, I was using a heritage malt and I didn't really mash it long enough uh, to fully convert all the starches. So the beer was, first of all, very thick, full-bodied and hazy, uh, which was not the intended result. On top of that, I lost control of my fermentation and the English yeast got a little too warm, which resulted in some rotten fruit esters, which is uh, not a great flavor, uh, especially when paired with that thick, full-bodied, high-protein kind of character that the beer ended up having. So that wasn't a great success. And then on top of that, it was also full of DMS. So not only did I fail to mash long enough to fully convert the beer, but I also failed to boil it long enough to actually get rid of all the DMS. There was a ton of issues with that beer. It was absolutely disgusting, and I ended up dumping it as well. However, for both of these two beers, I do want to do a rebrew of them so that I can kind of vindicate myself and give a good recipe to the rest of the world. So um, that'll be in our plans for next year. The next section here is talking about equipment gained or lost throughout the course of the year. So uh, I gained a lot more than I lost this year, um, although I did clear out a lot of clutter and junk when I moved. So first of all, I got a new kegerator that was the New Air single tap kegerator. Um, not the world's greatest kegerator, but it gets the job done. Um, it, I expanded that to have a quad tap and now a downsize to a triple tap tower on that one. So that's been fun. Um, I got a second Anvil Bucket Fermenter. The uh, Anvil Bucket is one of my absolute favorite fermenters of all time. It just nails that perfect middle ground between uh, having the benefits of a stainless steel fermenter, but not necessarily the complexity of a conical fermenter. I really do find myself fermenting more often in that than anything else. Um, I got the Benchmark Can Seamer. Um, the Benchmark Can Seamer has been really interesting. It's, I don't can that often, but when I do, uh, it is really convenient to have that. It's drill powered, which lowers the cost of the whole thing. Um, and it's maybe a little bit more tedious than bottling, but the cans are much easier to store and the cans are 
definitely a lot easier to give away when you're supplying your homebrew for other folks or giving away like six packs and stuff. So I have tended to gravitate towards that. It's a good item to have in the brew house, but definitely not a necessity. I also got the Anton Par Easy Dense, which is a very interesting digital refractometer. It's a pretty expensive piece of equipment, but it's given me excellent readings uh, for my specific gravity, my calculations for alcohol by volume as well. And it renders a very nice little neat graph that I can show during each of my brew day videos. So I've enjoyed that. I also bought the Kegland wrapped pill. Uh, that took me two attempts and about 60 days of shipping time to get it off of AliExpress over here uh, to the United States because you can't buy it in the United States. I used it for a couple batches and it was working relatively well but then I left it in a bucket of sanitizer for a little too long. It separated and short-circuited itself so unfortunately the wrapped pill is dead. I don't know if I'd buy it again. I didn't really use it all that much. Nothing against Kegland or Kegland's designs. It was entirely my fault for leaving it in sanitizer too long uh, and forgetting about it. Now, another big upgrade is the Whirlpool arm that I have been using along with my three-way valves uh, that I installed on my system at various points. I actually just released a video not too long ago that was uh, shockingly popular on how to uh, avoid using a hop spider, how to throw your hops in directly to the boil, um, and then using this whirlpool arm and these three-way valves to ensure you get a good whirlpool pile all that troop and hop debris in the center of the kettle and that way you avoid picking it up and clogging your plate chiller or your pump or anything else in your system. That video really does break it down very uh, nicely, I think, to show how these parts work and what kind of a difference and impact they've made for me. So that's been an, a major impact and a major change for me. I also got sent the 20 gallon claw hammer system. So uh, Emmett is a very generous person um, and he sent me the 240 volt 20 gallon system so now I've been able to interchange either 120 or 240 volts in my claw hammer 10 gallon system and a few times this year I've made a 10 gallon batch on 20 gallon kettle uh, for some really interesting split batch experiments which I've had a lot of fun with uh, and hope you have as well. And last but absolutely not least and maybe even the most notable upgrade Really, at the very end of this year, I was able to upgrade my camera equipment. I finally have a proper full-frame mirrorless camera, the Sony a7 IV, uh, with some nice Sony glass as well. So this has really enabled me to work a lot more inside. Um, the, one of the reasons why I was always outside before was because my camera that I was using at the time did not have the ability to work in low light and I had to crank the ISO so far up that uh, it was not really usable footage. But now, with the Sony a7 IV for you video nerds, right now I got a 50 millimeter f2.5 on there and be, I'm shooting only at ISO 1000. And I'm inside on a cloudy day with my lights set up pretty far away from me. It's actually really, really nice to be able to do this. And also working in S-Log3 and 422 10 bit, so it's actually really nice to be able to have that kind of flexibility, especially in post when I'm messing around with colors and, uh, and lighting and all that good stuff. So I'm hoping that the footage that you're seeing out of my most recent videos is a lot nicer than before, and I'm really hoping that elevates the production quality and the experience uh, for this channel. In terms of what I got rid of this year, um, really nothing too notable other than the wrap pill, which kind of I destroyed by accident, and the uh, hop spiders that I just don't really use anymore. Um, I used, I got rid of a ton of old stuff that I downsized uh, my equipment. A lot of things that I just hadn't used for a couple years, a lot of backup equipment. Um, when I moved here, I got rid of a bunch of that stuff. So there are a bunch of things missing, but none of them are really particularly notable, so I didn't really think to include them here today. But now, it is time for beer tasting number to and we are going to tackle an aged beer that has been sitting in my basement for a year and this is my Christmas spiced Weizenbach from last year. This is a, uh, a German dark strong wheat beer with uh, cinnamon, ginger, nutmeg, vanilla, and orange peel added to it. And I've actually not tasted this beer for about eight months so I'm really excited to see how this one has aged. Uh, and um, if it's still good. So let's go ahead and crack into it. All right, no overcarbonation. All right, so it is a really nice dark red color. A uh, little hazy, actually. Uh, pouring with a really thick, uh, kind of tan head on this one, actually. Um, 
Seems to be disappearing rather quickly though. It's a pretty nice looking beer overall, actually. Uh, let's go in for aroma. Ooh. Oh, wow. Huh. It's like really chocolatey. It smells chocolatey, figgy. Uh, a little bit of like a, a raisiny character. Candied, candied raisiny character. It's a sweet aroma. A little sweet bread. Uh, there's like a, a gingerbread note as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's what that is. Banana bread as well. Oh, there's the banana. Nice. All right, well, let's go in for flavor. That's a little bit uh, sharp, actually. That's disappointing. Um, a little bit oxidized, I think, maybe. Well, it has been like a year. <laughs> um, a lot of molasses. Oh yeah, lots of molasses. Uh, yeah, once you get past the little initial sharpness there, it's actually really nice. Okay, molasses. Like a fig, yeah. Uh, not quite raisin, not quite date, more like a fig. Um, caramel, burned caramel. Kind of similar to a Doppelbach, except uh, a little bit lighter. Interestingly enough, the body on this one is actually quite light. Um, I expected this to be a bit fuller, uh, but no. There's a lot of cinnamon in this too. So the spices have kind of faded, except for the cinnamon. I get the cinnamon, I get a little bit of ginger, um, I don't get the nutmeg, the vanilla, or the orange peel at all, which is a change from when I was younger. That being said, it's a nice, complex beer. Um, not as good as the triple I just tried, though, unfortunately. However, it is still an absolute treat and um, still very, very good. I think this beer really hit its peak at around six months of aging. Um, after a year now, it's kind of a little bit uh, past its prime, I think. Um, but it definitely needed a little time uh, to really develop and mature in the bottle. Uh, so it would have benefited from two or three months, I think, of aging before really drinking. I think four to six months is where this beer is really at its best. Um, after that, it seems like it kind of went downhill. But still, not a bad beer at all. A really nice color. Again, I, I like the dark wheat beer character. I'm happy with it, but it's not as smooth and as nuanced, I think, as my triple was. And I doubt it will be as smooth and nuanced as this Dark Strong Ale will be in a few minutes. But now we'll talk about the notable events for the year. Those of you who've been following the channel for a while know, because I've mentioned it 10,000 times, that I've gotten married. <laughs> I got married in June, and I also moved out of New Hampshire and into uh, a small town outside of Boston, Massachusetts, uh, at the same time. I'm now in a condo, no longer an apartment, but kind of a similar thing, and I think most people have received that change rather well. And I decided to keep the Apartment Brewer brand uh, going as the Apartment Brewer and not change it up. I think that's just too confusing for people, <laughs> and I still have plenty of content as the Apartment Brewer in an apartment on YouTube, and that's not going anywhere. But a couple other details about my personal life that I really didn't share too much about. Uh, I got promoted in the Army National Guard. That's my second job. Um, I moved from first lieutenant to captain, and uh, hopefully we'll be looking at a company commander slot at some point in the next couple of years. So another big change that I didn't actually mention at all uh, previously is that I actually got a new civilian job as well. So I used to work at a defense contractor uh, working on an air defense system, which was pretty cool um, when I was doing it. But as I moved down here, I realized that the commute was going to be absolutely terrible. So um, I actually started looking for jobs in the local area and I got picked up at a company that is working on next generation helicopter engines. So that's really fun. So new company, new job, new sector of engineering. Uh, it's actually really, really cool uh, being exposed to the stuff that I'm exposed to in this company. So very big change there, very positive one as well. And I'm sure many of you folks also saw when I moved here, I built out a basement brewery. Um, this has been a little bit of a dream for me for a while is having a dedicated brew space. So I wired up my basement to uh, allow for electric brewing and uh, put a hood in there that has been performing absolutely excellently. It handles all of the condensation and steam from a 240 volt boil, which is quite a lot to ask for. So check the basement brew series out if you haven't already and you're curious about building out a space indoors for brewing, um, it really has been a fantastic thing. The only thing that's really missing downstairs is a sink uh, to wash things in and to fill with, but uh, other than that, it really hasn't been a big problem. So I've been very happy, and eventually I think I'm gonna put that in, but it's gonna be a while before that actually happens. 
This year, I also participated in the National Homebrew Competition for the first time, um, and I had a really great experience. But surprisingly enough, I actually meddled in my first try. On a whim, I sent in the last six bottles I had of my Irish Stout, um, and they actually got a bronze medal in the category, which was crazy. I didn't win any medals on anything else, um, but it was a really good experience, and I think I'm gonna try it again next year. So, submissions open in January. I'm hoping to brew up some competition-worthy beers this year as well. I also did a lot of traveling this year. In March, I went to Belgium where my wife's family lives and uh, was able to taste some of the finest beers in the world and have an absolutely amazing uh, beer tourism experience, but also just a, a phenomenal time in the country in general visiting family, which inspired this long run of Belgian beers that I've been doing this whole year. Um, it was a pretty fundamental experience for me and I uh, highly recommend traveling to the country if you've never been. Uh, I also went to England and Scotland for my uh, honeymoon uh, as well. So that was in July and I had a really good time there as well, experiencing the beer culture, the pub culture, and uh, just traveling around. Outstanding place. It's I am well overdue to make a similar type of series of English beers and Scottish beers. Uh, I'm hoping to be able to do that sometime next year. And lastly, but certainly not least, I had an epic collaboration with Clawhammer Supply and Homebrew for Life uh, in April. I went down to Asheville to visit Clawhammer Supply. CH drove over from Tennessee, and we were able to brew a beer together in a Sprinter van, which was pretty cool, but also had a couple days of hanging out in Nashville and just uh, talking YouTube, home brewing, and all the fun stuff, hanging out with some outstanding dudes. So that was a great time, and I'm hoping to do something similar again next year. All right, so you've been patient with me. You've listened to me ramble on for however many minutes into the video this is. It's probably quite a few. Uh, and you've noticed this Belgian quad sitting here untouched to my left. And the reason why I left it for the end is because it is the favorite beer of the entire year. This beer, absolutely blew my mind when I tasted it after only six months of aging, so now we're out to nine months. If you go back and you watch the video that I made for this one, you'll see that I had nothing short of a religious experience tasting this beer. It was, indeed, out of the six years that I've been brewing, probably the best beer I have ever made. And for that reason, I don't open bottles of this lightly. Uh, I have only a few left. But looking back at this year uh, for the channel and reflecting on just how monumental of a year it was for this channel, uh, it's absolutely worth cracking this open to celebrate. And I'd rather celebrate it with you guys than just drinking this on my own. Even though I'm sitting here talking to a camera right now, I do really feel like I'm sitting at a pub drinking a beer with you guys. And that's kind of the whole goal here. So for those of you who are still watching, I really hope that you enjoy the tasting notes once again on this absolutely incredible beer. So without further ado, let's crack into it. <laughs> all right, it's a little over carbonated, but uh, that's all right. <laughs> These smaller bottles didn't really handle the carbonation as well as the big ones did, so Just gonna pour this one a little bit more slowly than I otherwise would. But I think for this beer, I am gonna go a full pour and we're gonna do yeast and all because it was that good. So when I tasted this beer on the channel, it had a dark red hue. It was absolutely clear, and that's because I poured it out of a big bottle. In a smaller bottle like this, there's a little bit more yeast cake, and as you could see, there's a little extra carbonation, which resulted in kicking up all the sediment. Rest assured though, that's not a bad thing though, because the Belgian yeast is really full of flavor, and you really should actually mix it in with your beers uh, when you're tasting them. The only reason I didn't do that with the triple is because it was the beginning of the video and I didn't want to completely clean out an entire triple uh, right before I started filming. So for the color on this one, it's looking like a nice kind of milk chocolatey brown color. There is a nice tan head, light brown head in there, really holding its shape and structure. Little bits of yeast on top of it there, but uh, nothing to be really too concerned concerned about. The overall color of the beer though is a mild brown color, definitely opaque. All right, let's go in for aroma now. Woo! <laughs> Aromatics are very different than the Weizenbach, that's for sure. It's a lot more chocolatey actually. 
a lot more chocolatey, a lot more spicy. There's just this really rich kind of caramel character to it. And then like a perfumey, uh, high floral character as well. So this is a 10 and a half percent quad. Um, so there was a lot of high alcohols produced in this. It lets you know it means business, that's for sure. So, all right, going for our first swig then in three months. Oh, that's a special one. <sighs> yes, that is a great beer. Wow. <laughs> the extra yeast does make it a bit more metallic than the last time I tasted it. However, it is rich. It is chocolatey. It is full of these dark, dark sugar notes, uh, caramelized sugar notes. Not burned though, not like the Weizenbach where it was a little bit on the burned caramel side. This is not harsh. Um, there's also no sharpness in it like there was with the Weizenbach. It's very similar to the triple in that it was a very elegant level of alcohol expression. So many notes of fig and plum and raisin, dark fruits, a little bit of molasses. Uh, oh my God. <laughs> it's a flavor, again, that just keeps evolving throughout the entire drinking experience. You take one sip and you're tasting this beer for 30 seconds. It, and it changes over the course of that time. Um, oh, a little bit of fruitiness, a little bit of bubble gum in there. Wow. Small amount of pear ester. But really, the backbone is a rich, rich malt character um, that is not quite bready, a little richer than that, um, but not one-dimensional at all. It's got that supporting character of, of caramel, dark raisin, and chocolate notes that are so freaking good with a little bit of fruit on top of it um, makes this an outstanding beer. And it's... <sighs> It's one of the reasons why this is just such a special beer for me. Um, now, if you'll give me a few minutes to expound on something, uh, Belgian quads are really the reason why I got into home brewing in the very first place. Back in 2016, I visited Brewery Omegang for the first time and I had their Three Philosophers Ale, which is a Belgian quad blended with a creek, which is absolutely amazing. It is an absolutely life-changing beer, uh, especially if you're a 21-year-old that's used to like Bush Light and Keystone Light. Uh, so <laughs> it really opened up my world in terms of what beer could be. And from that moment forward, I wanted to try and figure out how to make this myself. And having people in my family who brewed, uh, they kind of helped me along the way. And six years later, I'm able to make a Belgian quad that could really compete with it, at least for my own palate. Something that I made myself that turned out so good and is giving me the same exact drinking reaction. It's something precious. That is an awesome thing. And to be able to do that as a home brewer is what this hobby is all about. And that is why I like making these kinds of boring videos for you guys. Yes, and this is definitely the uh, the 9%, the 8%, and the 10.5% all speaking right now. But beer is something that brings us all together. It is something that has existed in human civilization since the very beginning of recorded history in Mesopotamia. History, human society, and civilization have been intertwined with beer ever since the beginning of history. And that is something that is so special that we continue to carry that tradition forward. Even if you're a home brewer, you're still carrying that tradition forward. You're carrying that connection forward and it's a really cool thing. And it's not to be taken lightly. So I wanna take this time to thank you for following my channel throughout the last 12 months. 2022 has been a pretty great year. Um, it is, it's amazing to me what happened and I don't think I could really top it in 2023, but I'm gonna do my best. And I have some things that I wanna talk about, some ideas for projects that I wanna take on over the course of 2023. And we're gonna start out with more travel videos because I found that I really, really enjoyed going to someplace that's not the New England craft beer scene. Uh, it's it's so nice to go somewhere, even, even Asheville was a really big difference because there was so much more focus on lagers than there was on IPA, so much more focus on the various styles of beer. Here in New England, it does seem like I'm drowning in hazy IPAs. They're great beers, but 
They're extremely common. Uh, going overseas and going to Belgium where you have absolutely amazing beers that put this one to shame and where you have uh, incredible brewing history and tradition. And places like England too, where beer and brewing has been intertwined with their culture for a very, very long time. And they have their own unique styles. It's really, really cool to have a style straight from the source. Those experiences are very, very fun and rewarding to capture. And I really do enjoy sharing my travel experiences with all of you. Um, they're not the most popular videos out there, uh, but they're really a ton of fun to make. And it's a good reminder that I'm in this for the video content and uh, for actually putting it out there as opposed to for the views. So um, I'm gonna continue making more of those travel type videos. There's also plenty of Kvike that I have yet to try. Um, I have a running list of about 10 different Kvike strains that I have yet to get my hands on and brew with. I really did enjoy working with Kvike this year. Um, I learned a lot about how to make a good beer with it. I learned a lot about its nuances and um, it's a very mysterious thing that I'm hoping to get a bit more grasp and mastery of. So uh, this upcoming year, I'm definitely going to focus on doing some more Kvike brews. Next, I realized I only really have uh, one or two kind of tart, funky, sour type styles that I've ever made. There's a definite lack of experience with sour beers on my channel, so I wanna do a little bit more of that sort of thing. Uh, I'm not gonna go full on blended lambic style souring. That's a, a year or two long project. I'm gonna go for more of the kettle souring at first, maybe a little Philly sour action, but we're gonna definitely take a, a dive into the sour and the funky this year because I do want to explore that a lot more. Um, and it's something that I do have a lot more appreciation for now. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I want to rebrew the two terrible failed beers that I had this year, the uh, Belgian Brown Ale and the English Pale Ale that was a hazy DMS filled mess. So I want to rebrew those and do justice to them. So that'll be on the list for next year. And also I'm gonna do NHC again. So I'll submit a couple beers this time, probably not five like I did last year. That was an incredibly expensive thing to ship and I will not be spending $300 in shipping ever again. Uh, so we might do two or three this year and kind of put my best foot forward on those. I definitely want that experience again and hopefully, fingers crossed, I can come home with some more hardware. I wanna do more collaborations next year as well. Uh, those are so much fun and there's so many YouTubers out there Trent at The Brew Show and I have something in the works. We're trying to make it work right now, so that's still in production, but I'm hoping to do a collab with him early next year. But there's so many brewing YouTubers out there that are doing great stuff that I want to work with. Uh, so I'm hoping that we could do more of that this coming year. And then lastly, a little bit of a curveball here. I'm doing a dry January this year. I'm doing it to not only take a break from the channel for a little while, but also just to kind of, you know, do something healthy for myself. Um, it is a good thing to do every so often to take a dry month off. A lot of people do a sober October, but I can't do a sober October and ignore Oktoberfest beers. So I'm electing to do a dry January instead. It's a good time to reset from the holidays, reset from all of the celebration and partying that's gonna happen over the last week of this year. So uh, I wanna make sure that I do that. There, the videos will not stop though. I want to emphasize that. I'm going, I have a couple brew days that are in the works. I don't know if I can get the tasting notes done by the end of the year. Uh, but if I do, there might be a grand glass video in January. If not, you're gonna see a lot more of the uh, kind of tips and techniques videos that I've been doing every so often uh, that are a little bit shorter. Those will get pushed and published in January. And then once February comes around, I'll resume working with grand glass videos. It also doesn't mean I'm gonna stop brewing in January. It's entirely possible to brew beer without drinking a beer. And also, you know, extended aging time in fermenters doesn't necessarily hurt the beer in most cases. So we're gonna continue brewing, we're gonna continue putting out videos, uh, but I'm just gonna have that sober January uh, that's gonna be a nice reset. Anyway, guys, I really do appreciate you joining me on this end of the year recap. Usually these videos end up getting the least amount of views over the entire year, but it's still something I think is important. For those of you guys who follow me pretty closely, I think you'll enjoy this video. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. The channel has come a really long way, not only this year, but over the last four years. And um, it's really nice to be able to take some time to reflect on that. Regardless of whether or not you're watching right now, I do wish each and every single one of you a happy new year and a great 2023. If you don't mind, please hit that like button. Please 
subscribe if you haven't already. Double check that subscribe button and comment down below with your thoughts on everything. I do enjoy reading those comments. And also, if you want to support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt, a hoodie, something like that from the merchandise store. I got plenty of great options and I hope you will find something there that you enjoy. I get a small amount of the profits from the sticker price on those sales. There's also plenty of other ways to support me. I have a Patreon, which helped increase the production quality of this channel significantly over the last year. So big thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys rock. I also have channel memberships and a super thanks button if you feel inclined to support me that way. I have an Amazon store where a bunch of my favorite recommended gear for, uh, for YouTube, for homebrewing, and for other items uh, can be found. So do check that out if you're curious about that sort of thing. If you want to follow me on more than just YouTube, I'm also active on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer. So check that out for some more frequent content. And stay tuned for the next couple weeks because there's going to be some very interesting Instagram and Facebook posts coming out soon. So I'm not going to say exactly what's happening, but something very exciting is happening and you're going to want to stay tuned. And last, but certainly not least, if you are still here, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. Not only watching all the way to the end of this video, but watching all the way to the end of the year. It's been a hell of a ride and I could not have done any of this without you guys. You guys are the most important part of this whole thing. So thank you for being here. I appreciate every second that you watch. So until the next one, cheers and have a happy and blessed new year.